We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to start from verses 11 to 13, and we're going to read this in honor of God's word this morning. Let's read together verses 11 in chapter 2 of Ephesians. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant's promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now, you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Amen? Amen. I want you to keep your Bibles open at this scripture. We're not done with it, but we're, we're, we're going to open up in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for this morning, Father, for the opportunity to just gather and to just learn from your word. Father, I pray that you would use me as your vessel, Lord, to speak appropriately. Holy Spirit, lead me so I can accurately, precisionly give out the word of God this morning. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. I want to first start off with a little story. You know, when I, when I get the opportunity to preach, I like to come on with just a little story to kind of get the inspiration of what gave me the word today, okay? So what was last week, church, on May 12th? Mother's Day. Yes, it was Mother's Day last Sunday, and um, Pastor John gave me the opportunity to preach this Sunday, so, you know, it takes a process of Holy Spirit, what's the word for the church? I want to be, you know, obedient to your word. And it all started on May 11th, the Saturday. So May 12th is Mother's Day. And May 11th is Saturday. Um, my mother uh, doesn't attend our church. She has her own congregation. Um, but it started with an experience and an encounter with my mother on May 11th. So May 12th, I tell my mom, Mom, you know, May 12th is Mother's Day. My calling is Weston. You know, I'm here in the morning serving. I'm here at Weston Vaughn. So I can't see my mom on Mother's Day. I can't see my mom on Mother's Day. So then, of course, the alternate is Saturday. Mom, I'll see you on May 11th, Saturday. And something that uh, me and Liana decided to do for Mother's Day, a gift was we decided to go to her house and cut the grass. Okay? That was our gift. You know, my mom is always like, don't spend your money. You know, it's all about the valley, sentimental, all about the thought. So we're like, okay, we're not going to buy you a bracelet. We're not going to buy you a necklace. We're not going to buy, we're going to cut your grass. And the grass is bad. <laughs> it's bad. Okay? So then we go. Uh, I, I go with my father-in-law, with Liana, we go, and then the moment we drive up to our driveway, we see my, you see, we see my lawn, you know, it's bad, it's pretty bad, and uh, if you're into landscaping, you know, if you're not into landscaping, I encourage you to value your grass, you know, people, people, if you have a nice lawn, people are like, wow, th this homeowner, this person takes care of their lawn, you know, so anyways, I come, and then my grass is bad, but then my neighbor, and my neighbor's grass was bad, <laughs> okay? So my neighbor's grass was bad, and then Leanna, my fiance, was like, oh, like, that, that grass is pretty bad. And then she just randomly said, what if, you know, I, what if that person sees us cutting our grass and then maybe asks us to cut her, her grass, right? Does that make sense? So we're going to cut my grass, but our neighbor's grass is even worse, and Leanna just randomly said, let's say they might ask us to cut their grass. And I'm just like, oh, you know, hopefully not. Because I'm not, I'm not really, you know, I like the, I love studying the Bible. I'm not a landscaper. But anyways, that was just a little side thing. So then as we're cutting the grass, guess what happens? The neighbor comes outside and it's, uh, you know what? I grew up in that house for maybe 10 years. Didn't talk much to my neighbor. She was an older lady, but she came out. And then she approached Liana and then said, hey, you know, I know you're cutting the grass. And I wasn't there yet. So it was, imagine she sees Liana as a stranger in a way. Can you, are you guys landscapers? Can I pay you to cut my grass? Right? And then I come up and I'm like, oh, I say her name and I say, oh, this is, oh, we're not a, a business. We're just doing a Mother's Day gift. We're just cutting our grass. And then, of course, you know, conviction in me, you know. Okay, we're here for Mother's Day. Are we, 
are we supposed to cut the neighbor's grass too? Because she asked us to kind of like hire us, but we, we weren't, you know, a, a, a landscape and cut. We, we just went to cut the grass. And then, of course, God used Liana and my mom to say, you should cut their grass. You know, you should cut their grass. And then uh, at the time, my lawnmower wasn't even working. So, you know, what, what, different things. It was like, okay, we're going to do it. So then we cut her grass. And we cut her grass. And then she's so happy. She's an older lady. And then this is what, what shocked me. She, I, I've known her for 10 years. And she goes, you know, assume. Um, and, and she didn't look well. And this is, the first, this is the first time I've seen her in a while. And I say, like, Margaret, you, you, you don't look too well. And then she goes, you know, I, I was actually um, diagnosed with uh, cancer. And then uh, when she said that, it really hit me, I said, wow, my neighbor, someone who I've lived beside for the past 10 years of my life, she was out gardening and just, you know, very active. And then, boom, she just gave me that report. From that report, you know, um, going back to my mother, you know, we cut the grass, we finished, and then she comes up to me. And as a mother of a pastor, you know, she'd always be like, you're a pastor. Saturday, your you're, 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 pastor is your calling. You don't ever take the hat off. I want you to pray for her. I want you to pray for her. And then I said, Mom, like, I don't, I don't know. You know, I don't know if she's a Christian. I, I don't know what, if she believes. And then my mom goes up to me and Liana and says, you guys have to pray for her. Even if she doesn't believe, you are called to do that. And then I go, but mom, you know, there are neighbors. I, I don't want to like pass this boundary of, you know, being, you know, that neighbor. Right? Does that make sense? But then God, Holy Spirit, convicted something in me where Leanne and I were talking and, and we said, we should go. We should go. We should go. So then, long story short, we ended up knocking on her door after cutting the grass and we prayed for her. We prayed for healing in Jesus' name. We told her, you know, who we are, what we believe in faith. And even if she didn't believe, we're believing for her and, and, and that she's going to, you know, get better. She's going to get better. But see, from that story, I made a mistake. First, you see, my mistake was at first, God maybe used my mom to tell us to go pray for her. But for me, my instinct was, uh, I don't know. She doesn't go to church. Does she go to church? Is, is, is she going to think I'm crazy? Is she going to think I'm weird? I'm a, I'm a weird neighbor. But my response should have been, yes. My response should have been, yes. That's right. She's my neighbor. She needs to hear the gospel. She needs to know what I believe. She needs to know what, I've, what, what her neighbors are praying for, right? So at the moment when I said no to my mom, what I did was I put up this wall. I put up this wall of maybe embarrassment, maybe a wall of maybe shame, maybe a wall of, you know, not risking our relationship with the neighbor. I put up this wall. And now that is how... From that Mother's Day story is what led to the message today. And I want you, and we're going to dive deeper into this. So now we're going to continue from Ephesians chapter 2, the same scripture, and we're going to start from verses 14. Okay? Let's read this together. It's going to be on the screen. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11. Forgive me. Verses 14 to 18. This is the key verse. For Christ himself has brought peace to us, he united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his body on the cross, listen here, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. So you read that. Christ broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups. Are you getting what I'm saying this morning? There was a time where Jews and Gentiles were separate groups. But through Christ, he broke down the wall that separated one. Verse 6, together as one body, Christ reconciled body, both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility towards each other was put to death. He brought this good news to, of peace, a good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of you can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. You see, the key verse is he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. If you're taking notes this morning, the title of the message is Break Down the Walls. Break Down the Walls. Can you repeat it with me, church? Break Down the Walls. 
we're going to break down the walls this morning. Amen? Amen. You know, in life, there are positive walls and there are negative walls. You know, some positive walls that I think of could be the walls around our church. You know, we're very blessed to have walls. So, you know, maybe temperature is great in the room. You know, let's say grocery store has walls. Imagine a grocery store doesn't have walls. Imagine a bank with no walls. Okay. That's not, that would be negative, but that's a positive wall. We have walls in our private time with the Lord. When you gather in your own space where you lock the door, you have the walls around. That's a positive wall, right? And there's walls around your home. Wherever you consider home, there are walls. I'm, I'm talking about physical walls right now. Physical walls that are positive that can support you. Then there are negative walls. There are, and I'm more focusing on the spiritual negative walls, such as the walls of separation, a wall that separates you from good and bad. Maybe you're on the bad side and, you know, there's a wall separating you to get to the good side. You know, there's a wall of exclusion where maybe you're not welcomed into a room or you're not welcomed into someone's hearts. That's a negative wall. There's also a wall of secrecy, a wall where maybe you are hiding something. You are living in sin. And you're hiding it in secret, and there's a wall keeping it within you, which is a negative wall. And then the last wall I have listed is the wall of rejection, where you feel rejected, where you're trying to enter somewhere, but there's a wall that rejects you. You know, going back to the story of the, the grass cutting, I put up a negative wall, and I'm one to say it by saying no to that immediate prayer. I said no because I was ashamed, but I was wrong there. We must not put up negative walls if we are in Christ. And today we're going to look deep into how we're going to break down these walls. All right? And with God's help, we're going to begin to break down these negative walls. Amen? Amen. We're going to break down these negative walls. You know, I want to now talk about the history a little bit here of the Gentiles and the Jews. If you, anybody, we all know what, Jew, what, what Jews mean. You guys all know Jews. Jews are the Jews. And I'm going to dive into the, the do we know what Gentiles mean? The focus today is I'm talking about Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles are non-Jews. So if you look at it, there's more Gentiles than Jews. Does that make sense? There are Jews and there's Gentiles. If you're not a Jew in this room, we are considered a Gentile. Okay? So that is the definition of Jews and Gentiles. And we're going to dive deeper into this history of Jews and Gentiles. You know, just a quick little funny story. Growing up, history class wasn't my favorite. Um, history class was one of those classes where if I would attend history class um, learning about, let's say, World War II, World War I, bomb of Hiroshima, all of these important things that happened in our history, it didn't interest me. But now, and I want to encourage you, the more you dive into the Word of God, you are encouraged to learn history. You are encouraged to learn of biblical times, of what happened in biblical times, and how it's affecting it today. And today, in today's sermon, we're going to go back a step to history. And we're going to look about what happened in the Old Testament, what is happening in the New Testament, and what is happening now. Okay? So if you're not interested in biblical history, I say you have to be. If you're in Christ, if you're a believer of Christianity, of Jesus Christ, history of Christianity, biblical times has to be your number one subject. Has to. Because everything here is factual. You're technically studying a history book, a living history book of everything that happened on earth. Amen? So I want to first talk to you about the Jews and the Gentiles. You know, something special about this relationship, well, I wouldn't even say it's a relationship. Something about this comparison is these two groups of people did not like each other. They did not get along. Okay? We read in the opening scripture, Jesus came to separate the walls. But first, why were these walls placed in the first place? Why were there even walls to separate the Jews and the Gentiles first? And there are a couple of reasons to start. And we look back in Old Testament history, okay? The first fact, and going back a little bit, it's more of the Jews. The Jews felt like they were more valuable than Gentiles in history. Jews felt like they were clean and Gentiles were ceremonially unclean. Okay, and we're going to look into scripture on why it says that, and we're going to dive in. The first is the Israelites were the ancestors of Abraham. Abraham, 
uh, if, if you're familiar with the story of Abraham, so Abraham, who's Abraham's wife? Sarah. So Abraham had a wife named Sarah. She couldn't conceive a baby at first. So then what happened was Abraham ended up having a, a, a child, Ishmael, with her maidservant, Hagar. Okay? So from there, Abraham had Ishmael. What is, who was the son that God gave Abraham that God had, that God kind of tested Abraham of his faith? It was Isaac. So if you know this, Abraham had two sons. And I'm going to focus, he had more sons, but I'm going to focus on Ishmael and Isaac. Okay? But when we learn in the descendants of Abraham through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those are the descendants and the lineage of the Jews, of the Israelites. Does that make sense? So from Ishmael was the Gentiles, and through Isaac was the Jews, was the Israelites. Okay? So from there already, there was some kind of a separation there. Because technically, what did God promise Abraham? What did God promise Abraham? That he, I will make you into a what? A great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse you. And all the people on earth will bless you. See, God chose Abraham, the lineage of Isaac and Jacob, to be his chosen people. Okay? But we're going to continue looking at God's nature. You might be thinking, why didn't God just choose the lineage of Ishmael too and Hagar? But why did he specifically just choose Isaac and Jacob? Okay? We're going to keep diving, okay? From this promise, God made a covenant with Abraham, okay? A sign of the covenant was circumcision, and then that's when God changed Abram's name to Abraham. It was Abram before that, and then it became Abraham. So that's the first thing. Because the Jews came from Isaac and Jacob through Abraham, they feel more valid. They feel more clean. Number two, we, know, we all know the story of Moses, Right? Where God chose Moses to go to Egypt and lead who? The Israelites. The Israelites. Not the Gentiles. The Israelites were in slavery. So God used Moses to free the Israelites. The Jews. The chosen people. So from there, Gentiles are like, what about us? God specifically chose the Jews. Okay? And number three, if you continue to read the Old Testament... All the kingdoms led by Saul, Solomon, King David, all Israelites, all Jews. We see them having many wars, many battles against the neighboring lands, right? All these neighbor lands were Gentiles, right? There's the Philistines, right? There's the Mo Moabites, or I'm going to read it correctly, the, the Ammonites, the Edomites. These are all Gentiles, and they're battling the Israelites. So see, in history, in the Old Testament, we see that there was this separation between the Jews and the Gentiles, okay? And then from there, in time, it became a natural thing. It became, oh, you're a Jew? Okay, I'm not on your side. Oh, you're not a Jew? Okay, I'm going to hang with the Jews, okay? This was Old Testament before Jesus came. That was it because God's plan was using his chosen people for a purpose. And we're going to continue seeing that purpose as we go on, okay? So now we're going back to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. Church, are you following me? Are you, does that make sense with the Jews and Gentiles? It's very important to understand that history to understand this message. The Jews and the Gentiles at once were separated. Okay? Let's read this scripture once again. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. We're going to read it. Verse 11. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. So now this is Paul speaking in the New Testament. He's saying used to be outsiders. So there must be something that happened to break that. Right? You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. So you see here what Paul is saying. Back in the day, circumcision was a physical sign that they were a Jew, that they were clean. But what Paul is saying now is that it only affected their bodies and not their hearts. Are you getting to me where I'm at, Christ uh, Christians, church? Paul is saying our heart is very important than our body. Th that makes sense, okay? In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. We Gentiles. I'm a, technically, I'm a Gentile. I'm not a Jew. We used to be outsiders. We're not outsiders. We used to be outsiders. 
but something happened. But something happened because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, those walls have been broken down. There's no more separation between Jews and Gentiles. We are now one. We are now one. Okay? And you know what? Like, what I love, what I love about the Bible is when you read something in the New Testament, see, if you see what Paul just wrote there, he basically was quoting and referencing the Old Testament. Right? You uncircumcised, he's talking about that, he's talking about back in the day you were outsiders, you know, you weren't clean. It's all because it was all in the Old, Te Old Testament text, okay? And now in the New Testament, I want us to look at a story in the book of Acts. Today is the day of Pentecost, you know, the book of Acts of Peter. Pastor John mentioned Peter today. Peter and how he responds to this Jew and Gentile division. You know, even when Jesus, you know, before he began his even when he was in his ministry, that Jew and Gentile mentality was still there, right? Jesus was the king of the Jews. So, so Gentiles were like, you're only king for the Jews and not the Gentiles. But Jesus had a different message. Jesus had a different message. But now let's look at Peter, how Peter responds after uh, Jesus ascends and, and goes to heaven, okay? You know what? Like I have the scripture here with me and just to honor time. Wow, time. I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to explain the story, okay? So, the, the, um, Brian, you can follow along. You know what? Let's read the scripture. You know what? Let's read the scripture. Let's read the scripture. Let's read it. We're going to go to Acts chapter 10, verses 1, okay? Acts chapter 10, verses 1. And the title of my Bible says, Peter visits Cornelius. Cornelius. And this is after Jesus rose and ascended to heaven, Okay? So now we're going to focus on this man named Cornelius, and let's see what happens. The next day at Cornelius' um, forgive me, verse number one. In Caesarea, in Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. Ciao. <laughs> Buongiorno. Am I saying it right? <laughs> okay. Ital so he was a captain. That means he wasn't just a soldier, he was in charge. He, he's, he's a big boss, okay? He was, but listen, he was a devout man, God-fearing man as everyone in the house. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel coming toward him. Cornelius, he said, and remember, just because he believed in God, did he believe in Jesus Christ yet? Not yet. He believed in God but not Jesus yet because this is after Jesus' message. And Peter, God is using his disciples to spread the gospel, okay? Cornelius stared at him in terror. You see, he was scared of this angel and said, what is it, sir? He asked the angel, and the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to heaven have been received by God as an offering. So you see, Cornelius lived as an honest, God-fearing man. Good. He's a good example. Then send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter, which was Peter the disciple. He was staying with another Simon, a tanner, who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what has happened and sent them off to Joppa to get Peter. Okay? So for what do we learn from Cornelius right now? He was a good man. Okay? He served the Lord. He gave to the poor. He served, okay. He was also a captain, so of course he worked, had, maybe had a high, good paying job, maybe. But the key point here is an angel appeared to him and he immediately obeyed and sent for a stranger named Peter. He doesn't know who Peter is, okay. Now we're going to go to verse 9. And let's follow, church, are you with me here? Verse 9, the next day as Cornelius' messenger was nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon and he was hungry. Peter was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet, so imagine Peter sees this vision. Imagine a white sheet comes down, okay? And on that sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Kill and eat. Okay? You know, 
just referencing to the Old Testament, if you read in Leviticus chapter 11, it's literally Leviticus 11. If you want to go read that at home, it talks to you all about ceremonially clean and unclean animals. Because the Jews were given laws of specific animals they should eat, how they should eat, and what they don't eat. But now Peter is getting a vision from saying, pick and eat. Pick and eat. And look at Peter's response. No, Lord, because he's following what he's accustomed to. No, Lord, Peter declared, I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have de declared impure and unclean. So Peter's just being a, a, a lawfully man. He's just honoring the Jewish law, right? But the voice spoke again, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. Are you made clean, church, this morning? Are you made clean, church, this morning? Okay? The same vision was repeated three times expressing importance okay clearly God was trying to show Peter something here that do not say something is unclean when I God say it's clean okay then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven God was trying to teach Peter something God was trying to teach Peter something very important that will last us up until today okay and let's see okay verse 17 Peter was perplexed what could the vision mean just then the men sent by Cornelius Found Simon's house. So now after Peter gets this vision, Cornelius' men get to the door and see Peter. Okay? And Peter's, I just had this dream and now I have strangers at my door. They asked if a man named Peter was staying there. Simon Peter. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling, because he's trying to understand what this vision means, the Holy Spirit said to him, three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry for I have sent them. Okay, don't worry, have I have sent them. Okay, we're going to continue reading. We're almost done. Stay with me. This is very important, okay. Verses 21, Peter went down and said, I'm the man you're looking for. Why have you come? 22, they said, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout, God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to this house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. The next day he went with them, accompanied the brothers by some of the brothers from Joppa. Okay, now this is where the change happens through the life of Peter. What are we going to learn from Peter? Verse 24, they arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. So imagine this Italian captain waiting for Peter. He's hosting. Great hospitality, brings his friends and family to join this party, to join this event. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. Cornelius fell at his feet to worship Peter. Okay? I love that. But I, I love Peter's response even more. But Peter pulled him up and said, stand up. I'm a human being just like you. How humble. How honoring of Cornelius. But how humble of Peter. So they talked together and went inside, and many were assembled. So now this is where Jews and Gentiles come into place. So Peter, who is a Jew, is entering a Gentile's home. Peter told them, you know, it is against our laws for a Jewish man, which is Peter, to enter a Gentile home like this and to associate with you. So Peter is recognizing. He's saying, it's wrong for me to originally do this, but God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure and unclean. Church, are you getting what I'm saying this morning? No longer is Peter saying that we're, someone's better than the other. No, we're all equal. We're all clean. Why? With the sanctification and crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Do you see it, church? Do you see it? What used to be this wall of separation is now broken. Jesus broke down the walls. Jesus broke down the walls. And he's still breaking walls today. He's still, that, that's a huge wall. That wall is amazing. That wall is gone. No longer are we Jew or Gentiles. We are what? Sons and daughters of God. We are not Jews or Gentiles. We're not better or worse. We are sons and daughters of the living God. Amen? Do you believe that this morning? Do you declare that over your life, that you're a son and daughter? I'm not a Gentile. I'm not a Jew. I'm not unworthy. I'm a son. I'm a daughter of God. Do you believe that this morning, church? I believe it. I come from Thailand. I wasn't born Jewish. I'm a son and daughter of God. 
not even about my culture. It's not even about my heritage. It's not even about where I was born. It's about my faith in Christ. And that should be your story too. Come on, church. Give, give the Lord a clap off this morning. Oh, boy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for breaking down the walls. Thank you, Jesus. That wall has been broken, has been separated. You need to know that. Okay? You need to feel that value of Christ. So from that story, we learned that Cornelius was a, a, a Gentile. He wasn't a Jew. Okay? He obeyed God by sending Peter, by sending for Peter. We mentioned the whole, you know, Cornelius fell to his feet. Can I just mention that quickly? You know, this is a side note. Cornelius fell to the feet of Peter, okay, because of honor. Remember, Cornelius was a Roman captain. Ca Imagine the head of police, Toronto police, falling down to the feet of a preacher. You see, at Weston, my job is, my honor is to Pastor Jonathan. When Pastor John walks in the room, I shun. I honor him. Pastor John, make sure I greet him and make sure he's taken care of, whatever I need to do to, to honor him. And then I get, if I don't do that, I don't, feel, I don't feel I've done my job to honor him. The Bible teaches double honor, okay? You know, something, something you know, I, I want to mention this as well. It's more of a shout out. You know, one of the hats that I, I wear at Weston is, is youth pastor. So I get the privilege to pastor our youth. They're amazing and I love all of them. Every Sunday morning, this is what honor is. And Gabriel Adagoki, every time he comes at 9.30, because his father Ola leads pre-service prayer, which you're all invited to join. Gabriel will walk in, even if I'm on the computer doing lyrics, I'm doing sound, he'll put on his jacket, he'll come to me and just shake my hand. He'll just greet me. He'll just greet me. And I've told Gabriel this, and I said, Gabriel, I'm proud of you because that's what honor looks like. And it's not to boost me up. It's to, I see his heart. His heart is, this is my pastor. I'm, uh, and you should do the same with your pastor, with Pastor Jonathan. You should do that the same even with your parents. Honor, honor. Just like Cornelius got on his feet for a stranger, for Peter. Honor at Weston. If you're not honoring at Weston, then are you really in Christ? Are you really in Christ? Come on. Come on, church. You believe me? You, you, you feel what I'm saying? Honor, honor, honor. We want that culture here, okay? We want that culture here. So Cornelius honored, and that's just a little side note. God used Cornelius. So see, a, Jew, a Gentile, God even used Cornelius to, 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 to show Peter this. And, and Peter, of course. And just imagine if Cornelius didn't actually send for Peter. Imagine if Cornelius wasn't a God-fearing man and didn't obey then this wouldn't even maybe be written in scripture to teach us that there are no longer that wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles. Okay? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have, have two verses for you. In Acts chapter 10, 44, 46, this is a continuation of now Peter is meeting with Cornelius. Okay? And Peter is with Cornelius. And look at this. Verse 44, Acts chapter 10, 44. Even as Peter was saying these things. So now Peter is saying, we're no longer Jews and Gentiles. What Jesus did, we're, we're not separated. The Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to this message. The Jewish believers, who of course originally were the chosen, came with, who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out to the Gentiles. So see, at first, the Jews were the only ones that were empowered by the Spirit. But now they're experiencing that the Gentiles, we also can have that power. We were baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Gentiles was poured out to by the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. There's evidence that Jews, at first they were the chosen people. That's God's plan. He wanted to use them for his purpose. But now, Gentiles. We are a part of that. We are a part of that. They were amazed. They were amazed. And you know what? I, I just love that. Church, do you love that? Like, like people, if people ever tell you, look at the Old Testament and God was, you know, he only chose the Israelites and he only battled the, he, he, he caused war. You need to really read the Bible. How did it start? What is the plan of God? And where does it end? See, you need to understand. See, as a growing Christian, I didn't understand that at first. Like, God, why did you only choose the Egypt? Why are you saving uh, the, the Israelites from, from Pharaoh? But not, but not. 
not the Roman soldiers too. But see, it's all a part of his plan. And his plan is perfect. His plan is perfect. And we're living today in that perfect plan. We're living today in that. Okay? Have you guys ever heard that saying, good people go to heaven? You've heard that before? What about the good people? Sorry, I don't want to be like mean. What about the good people that, that aren't believers? Do they go to heaven? But this person is a good person. Do they go to heaven? This person feeds the homeless. Do they go to heaven? Do they? Now let me ask you, would Cornelius have gone to heaven if he didn't meet Peter? There it is. No. But wait, Scripture says he was a God-fearing man. He gave to the poor. He was a good guy. Good people don't go to heaven. Believers of Jesus Christ go to heaven. If you are in Christ, you're going to heaven. Jesus is clear. I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay? So now Peter was used to share the gospel to this good man. You know, I believe in our lives. We have good people around us. I believe we have great people around us. Good people. Might even be our closest family members, our closest friends, just like Cornelius. But we need to be like Peter, a disciple, and share the gospel. Share what Jesus did, came to do, so that those good people can be saved. Does that make sense? Good people don't go to heaven. Christians go to heaven. Are Christians good people? Should be. <laughs> yes, Christians should be good people. You guys are good people. I want us to say, I'm a good person. Through Christ, through Christ. <laughs> that's good, that's good. At this time, you know, Alex, I'm going to invite Alex to come up as we're going to kind of narrow it down a little bit. Church, are you getting the message this morning? Please don't, uh, I think God, God was trying to get, get me to, to share this, this message of equality, this message of peace, this message of exclusiveness in Christ, that you're not meant to be excluded. And if you're sitting in here, and, or maybe you're watching online or going to watch this later, the message of Jesus Christ is for everyone. The message of Jesus Christ, that's why he came to this earth. If it wasn't for everyone, it would have just stayed with the Jews. Jesus didn't have to come, but he came. But Jesus came. You know, I believe today, even though Jesus broke down that wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles, where we're all now one, given the opportunity to hear the gospel, I still believe, and it's sad to say, but the enemy, the trickster, he's still putting up walls today. He's, he's scheming. In my language, I like to say he's bugging. He's, you know, moving wrong. He's putting up walls today that's, that's affecting Christians, affecting even non-believers, so that non-believers would never be Christians. He's putting up these walls so that people could not hear the gospel. You know, there are walls. The biggest wall that comes to my mind is the wall of racism, racial disquality. You know, I only hang around with my race. You only can talk to your race. I shouldn't hang out with the opposite race because, you know, we don't, we're culturally different. That's a negative wall that the enemy is putting up today. I can't stop that. But Jesus can. And maybe Jesus is using us, through us, to stop that. To repel that, that wall of racism. You know, at Weston, you know, we don't, I'm going to share something a little personal. It's not in my notes, but when I first came to Weston, and I'm going to be honest, I have, as, as, when I first came to Weston, one of my negative thoughts was, and I'm wrong for this, correct? I'm, I'm one to tell you I'm wrong. Where are my Asian brothers and sisters? You know, that was 2021, my mindset. How immature of me. How immature of me to say that. I see we're a very multicultural church, which is amazing. 
but I was immature to be like, where am I Asian? Because I'm Asian. But see, I've learned that it's not about that. It's not about our race. It's not about our culture. It all comes down to Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus. We're one. You believe in Jesus. We're one. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. That wall of racism needs to be broken down. I've, I've grown past that. I'm marrying an Italian woman. <laughs> I've grown past that. Um, but I'm one to tell you that I've, I've failed before. And it's okay to realize that, even for you too. Realize when you're wrong. Allow Holy Spirit to transform you. I'm a living testimony of that. The wall of racism needs to be broken down. And we need to be carriers of Christ in our city. Because we need revival in Canada, church. We need revival in Canada. And it stops with these separation walls. These walls need to be separated. You know, stereotypes, the wall of stereotypes refer closely to racism. That wall needs to be gone. The wall of exclusiveness. You know, I love that Pastor John mentioned that Megan's Connect Group is not just only for women. It's supposed to be inclusive, men and women. We include, break down the walls of exclusion. Everyone is invited. Everyone is welcomed. Everyone is welcome at the seat of the table. There's a big table in heaven and everyone is welcomed. You are welcomed. And if you are sitting here today and you're wondering, am I invited to the kingdom of God? Yes. Yes. That's the gospel. Everyone's invited. The wall of social status, this one hurts me, where you only maybe hang out with those of economic class Maybe you only hang out with those that work the same job you work or maybe make the same income as you. Maybe you hang out with people that, you know, or, or you're afraid of people that, that's not important. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ, these negative walls have nowhere in your life. No place in your life. These walls of racism, stereotypes, social status, economic class, no place in your life if you're in Christ. Your job, and if you claim to be a Christian, needs to be lifting out your hand and welcoming someone I'd probably say the opposite of you. You know, that should be my role. That should be your role. Go out of your way to break that wall. Go out of your way to make a friend with somebody of the opposite culture. Learn about the opposite culture. You know, at church, what I love about Weston is all cultures are represented here. You know, I'm standing up here. I see multicultural faces, and I, I think I have that gift. I can just look at you and just maybe guess your culture. We're very cultural. Our cultures need to be appreciated, represented, valued. But it, does, it should not be a negative wall that hinders us from our faith. You know, I heard this quote from a pastor one day. Write, write this down. This one's good. We are all, I'm, I'm going I'm to read it. Just, I, I don't want to get this wrong. We are all, we are all differently cultured, but we are all commonly human. And Jesus came to save humanity. He didn't come to save the Italian culture. He didn't come in to save the Asian culture. He didn't come in to save the Jamaican culture. He came to save humanity. 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 Amen. 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 And if you're in Christ, that needs to be your positive push. Equality. Welcoming everybody to your house. Welcoming everybody to your table. Not just your people. And watch Holy Spirit use you in mighty ways. Watch you, God use you just like Peter did. Walking into a Gentile home. Watch what Peter did. Holy Spirit fell down on the Gentiles in that home. They were amazed. Watch God use you. And watch God use you as a reflection of His Holy Spirit. Watch it happen. 
if we are in Christ, we are not determined by our race. We are not determined by skin culture, our culture, our heritage, our occupation. We are sons and daughters. Sons and daughters. You know, I want to talk a little bit, as we're, we're wrapping up soon, wrap, but I, I, I want to get to this point. I want to talk a little bit about God's nature. God's nature. And this, is, this makes me love God so much more when I read this. It was like, when you read your Bible, sometimes the one sentence that you've never read before or never paid attention to before, it captures your heart. You know, I mentioned earlier the Exodus, the, uh, the Exodus story, right, where Moses came and freed the Israelites from slavery. It is clear and we know that God said, free my people. Free my people. The Israelites were God's chosen people. But let's read something here. In Exodus 12, chapter 31 to 33, we're continuing on from the Exodus. So now God used Moses to save his people, the Israelites, the Jews, king of the Jews. Verse 31. Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron during the night. Get out, he ordered. Leave my people. So after the ten plagues, Pharaoh's like, I've had enough. Leave. Take the rest of the Israelites with you, the Jews. Go and worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you said and be gone. Go, but bless me as you leave. So this is Pharaoh talking, Ramses. All the Egyptians urged the people to, of Israel to get out of the land as quickly as possible for they thought we will all die okay now the israelites are being saved okay pharaoh says get out let's skip to verse 37 this one church i need you to dive in here i need you to lock in here verse 37 that night the people left ramses pharaoh and started for sukkoth there were about six hundred thousand men plus all the women and children Verse 38, a rabble of who? A rabble of who? Non-Israelites. Huh. A rabble of non-Israelites went with them. But wait, I thought the Israelites were only the chosen people. Huh. A rabble of non-Israelites went with them along with great flocks and herds of livestock. Do you get what I'm saying? Did God refuse those non-Israelites? No. Was his purpose the Israelites? Yes. But did he refuse the non-Israelites? So this shows you a little bit of God's character in the Old Testament. He's a God of what? L-O-V-E? A God of love. He's a God of love. Even these non-Israelites who technically weren't invited in this exodus, God allowed them to still join the freedom that they offered the Jews. And that's because it was intentional in God's long-term plan that the Gentiles would be a part of this exodus. And today we are living in it. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Wow, non-Israelites. When I read that, I said, God, you're so good. Because you are always had the Gentiles in mind. You always had the Gentiles. Jesus, so good, so good. Wow. A rabble of non-Israelites went with them. I can't, I, I can't, I can't. God's love is for everyone. God's peace is for everyone. God's joy is for everyone. God's forgiveness is for everyone. The gospel of Jesus Christ of Nazareth is for everyone. If you receive it, say amen right now. The gospel of Jesus is for you. It's for everyone. If you're watching online, it's for you. It's for you. I'm going to invite the church to stand with me this, this, this morning. You know what? Pastor John, with your permission, can we extend service a little bit? Thank you, Pastor. I'd like to invite the whole worship team up. Yeah, the whole worship team. And um, production team, if we can uh, maybe get the house lights down. Let's go to red lights maybe. Thank you, uh, production team. I want you to take this Pentecost Sunday seriously. I want you to take this Family Day Sunday seriously. You're not here 
as a coincidence whether it's God whether it's your mother your father whether it's your friend somebody whether you're serving God led you here and Pastor John mentioned it earlier you're gonna leave with something today and I believe today you're gonna leave with something this morning I believe it you know the the idea and title of the message is break down the walls and the idea is equality the idea is, what are you doing when you leave church today to make sure that those around you aren't left out? Aren't left out. Dream Team, my command to you is, welcome everybody that comes to Weston. New, newcomers, we welcome you. That's why Pastor John had a welcome at the, before the message. Because we want you to feel special. We want you to feel included at Weston. Because you are invited into the kingdom of heaven. There is proof in New Testament scripture that the gospel is not just meant for the Jews. We know the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of the Israelites, of all nations, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit make disciples of all nations John 3 16 for God so let's read it let, let, for God so loved for so God loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever whoever anyone everyone whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life amen, amen. thank you jesus for breaking down these walls so that all who choose to can come to you thank you jesus